Today in Agronomy on KFIL AM 1060 with Pioneer Field Agronomist Allie Wise and Josh Schaffner. Here's Josh and Allie. Good morning, Southeast Minnesota. It's July 7th, 2021, and this is episode 76. Uh, Allie kind of had a nice break there for the 4th of July holiday, um, kind of our GDU accumulation. Sure. Uh, kind of held true through the weekend, uh, a lot of heat, uh, some warm days, some warm nights, and uh, hopefully a little bit of moisture relief across the area here and a little cool down midweek. But um, kind of looking at GDU, does Allie, kind of how are we sitting as we kind of really turn the page here and kind of head into the second half of the growing season? Yeah, so I just pulled the GDUs out of Preston, Minnesota, relatively central for where we, we work here in southeast Minnesota. And since that April 15th planning date, we're sitting at about 1195 GDUs to date. Uh, That would put that particular area 193 GDUs above normal. So certainly still pushing a pretty aggressive pace above the norm there, which is nice to see, especially as we're coming into fungicide season here. Um, And always good when we can hit some of those fungicide applications kind of mid mid July here. But you know, so like I said, that definitely puts us ahead. In the next 14 days, we're actually forecasted to be at 1,500 GDUs or so. So um, that's very significant, especially when you think about even some of our full estate hybrids are going to be soaking around 1,300 GDUs. So, um, you know, majority of products are going to soak between, I don't know, 1,100 and 1,300. So we're about to hit a huge window of fungicide applications in, in corn specifically, Josh, would be my take. Yeah, and, and looking at GDU, um, you know, I think that was an April 20th start, give or take there a day. And um, a lot of the hybrids are going to need 1,250 GDUs to get to tassel. So depending on planning date there, um, that's probably kind of the, the next big thing we got going on here is uh, um, kind of that that fungicide application in corn. I've had a lot of questions of growers saying, how many days still are there? We, we know it's getting close. There's a lot of flags leaf showing a little dip in temperatures this week. Could stall that a little bit, Allie, but um, you know, I, I'm guessing we're probably for the most part, eight to 14 days should catch the tassel window. And with that said, obviously uh, that's coming up quick, Ellie. And I think uh, we'll maybe spend the first segment here, spend a little bit of time on that corn fungicide application and kind of, you know, should we be looking at it? Some of the factors we need to take a look at um, uh, for that. So starting out, Ellie, I always like to look at the weather, um, kind of what we've been dealing with. And um, I know, you know, I'd like to get your take, but I always like to look at that GDU number first. Yeah. So, you know, GDUs, if we look at this year, we're obviously ahead of normal, like we've discussed. The reason that's important is that anytime we're tasseling earlier or making those applications in that mid-July window, we can use those fungicides to really kind of increase that plant life and take full advantage of that green fill window, any photosynthesis. Hopefully we're going to have some, a nice sunlight here. Um, so really, in my opinion, it's just taking advantage of, you know, the full season and green fill that we have. Uh, um, to capture here, knowing that we're going to tassel much earlier than maybe the norm. Yeah, yeah, always a great point. And when we have an opportunity to extend the growing season, uh, when we're way ahead, uh, that's kind of what we're looking at. And I think sometimes, Allie, too, you know, outside of disease, when you look at the yield response from fungicide, that's really where it comes from, is that that plant health extending the growing season uh, and taking advantage of that. Um, you know, previous crop, always something um, we like to look at too, Allie. Um, you know, I always look at growers that are looking at, hey, I'm going to do you know, 50% or two thirds of my acres. Uh, I always like to look at, you know, where's the previous crop and really focus on that corn on corn first. Uh, historically, we'll probably see more diseases like Northern corn leaf blight, uh, gray leaf spot. Uh, obviously we'll be, be looking for tar spot as well as we get into August, see if that's an issue. But uh, uh, that previous crop always focus on those corn on corn acres first. You know, and I think that's extremely important. Uh, you know, it's kind of staying on that uh, disease thing, um, Allie, you know, scouting ahead of time, never a bad thing. And uh, ideally, hopefully if we're scouting, we're seeing clean fields. What are some things we want to look at uh, from a scouting standpoint? Yeah. So like you said, disease pressure is obviously important in a lot of cases. And, you know, seemingly this year too, prior to tassel, we're maybe not going to see a lot of presence of diseases yet. Um, if you are, however, out in these fields and you're seeing maybe northern cord leaf blight, um, gray leaf spot anthracnose could even be coming into play. If you're seeing any of those more common diseases already, you know, pre-tassel, that automatically, in my opinion, is going to rank that field as a very high candidate for fungicide. You know, certainly we're not seeing a lot of disease this year yet, um, but I think where my mind is at is that we see a lot of potential on this crop. So that's kind of where I've started to focus myself um, on some of these considerations. And I think, you know, arguably, if we look at the next point, taking a peek at what the yield potential of your crop and crop is, is probably one of the biggest pieces of this fungicide puzzle this year. 
Yeah, it, it is. And when you think about the yield, um, you know, fungicide isn't going to increase yield. It's going to protect yield. And, and sometimes we're always looking at how many bushels are we getting? Sometimes um, I sometimes look at like what percentage are, are we, we saving or protecting? And, and obviously if you got a, you know, a 250 potential versus 150, you're probably going to get a more bushels out of a, a corn crop that's looking good. So I always like to look at, you know, where's the GDUs, where's our previous crop and where do we think, we, where do we think we got our most bushels? Those are our target fields that I like to look at for corn. Cause I just think that's where we're going to get our, our biggest return on the investment. And, and kind of putting that together too. Sometimes, Allie, when you got a lot of yield potential, uh, we want to make sure we get it in the combine. And, and fungicide can be a great tool to help uh, harvestability down the stretch too. Yeah. So I think kind of as a final wrap up on corn fungicides, in, our, in my opinion, I'd, I'd be expecting a really heavy fungicide year in conversations that I've had with you, our customers. These, these commodity prices are certainly going to have a lot of fungicides flying on. Uh, like we said, we don't see a lot of disease currently, but there's a lot of potential in this crop. So if you start doing the math on if you're paying, say, you know, $25 for full application and you're sitting at 650 corn, you're probably looking at four bushels needed to get you a nice return on that investment. So when we come back from break, we'll wrap up any other considerations on fungicide and also give our take on fungicide applications and soybeans. Welcome back listeners. So Josh, good discussion in segment number one, just walking through those considerations of where am I likely to find a higher return on investment of making some fungicide applications in corn. Um, did just want to track that into maybe a few follow-up questions as we look to make these applications. One of those being, you know, a lot of times we've talked a lot about corn rootworm. We know beetles are typically out at that time. Um, what are some of those considerations around potentially adding an insecticide with that fungicide application? Yeah, no, that's a good point. You know, corn rootworm populations have been on the rise and, and based on what we've been seeing below ground alley, I anticipate to see a lot of beetles emerge here uh, as the tassels come out. Uh, and, and adult beetle control can be a, you know, sometimes it can be necessary if we had a lot of feeding and they're coming out and, and we risk, you know, maybe some silk clipping or sometimes they'll even chew on kind of the tip of the ear there. Uh, but that can be an easy way to control them. And if you're going to go corn again next year, maybe just trying to, to, to control the egg population for next year too, but a pretty inexpensive addition to fungicide. And I always like to think about it, you know, if you can save three kernels per ear, you're already probably at a positive return on investment. So it's not going to take much to do it, but uh, something to consider um, as we get there. And uh, especially if you're going to stay in some long range corn on corn is something I, I really encourage. Yeah. So just like I said, I think it's good to walk through that. Just another thing you could consider, especially if you're going planning to be corn in that particular field next year. You know, one other follow-up question before we shift focus to soybeans, I just like to get, in your opinion, if we aren't planning on spraying all of our corn acres with fungicide, what are those overall focus areas you're looking at? Yeah. If you're not going to do them all, I always just kind of narrow it down to this. Number one, where's your first plant of corn? Number two, where's your corn on corn? Number three, where's your highest yielding corn? That's probably the order of things that I look at of, hey, if I'm just going to try a 25 or 70 acres for the first time, or I'm only going to do half or two thirds, I would kind of work down those three things. And, and that's where I'd focus my applications. Perfect. I think now, like I said, we'll just shift focus to, to soybeans. Obviously, much of our growing areas soybean crop is going to be approaching that R3 growth stage here relatively soon, um, some a little sooner than others. Um, has many of our, our customers asking whether they should look at applying a fungicide to soybeans. Um, always good to look at those parameters around what to consider when deciding, um, especially with the current soybean prices of fungicide application. You know, it does make us maybe a little more prone to, to heavily consider that. We talked about this a little bit on last week's show, Josh, um, kind of number one in our mind, if you're looking to make that fungicide application, it's going to be, can you make a timely application at R3 to maximize your return on that investment? Yeah, timing is everything. And, and we should mention on corn, we really want to target that R1, 100% tassel to R3, a lot of other factors in corn. Uh, with soybeans, <clears throat> you know, we're not going to go through all the things of planning date, this, that. It's really all about timing. And timing it at, at that R3 window or maybe just a little beyond R3. Um, data really suggests with soybeans, it's all about timing. If you kind of jump too early or you jump too late, it seems like the return on investment diminishes pretty rapidly. So looking for that R3 is the critical thing. And it'll be interesting, Ellie, to see how this season shakes out. I mean, some of these corn and soybean applications could actually overlap a little bit potentially. We've seen some beans at, at R2 um, you know, always hard to gauge exactly what window will hit R3. It's going to vary field by field and maturity and planning date and other things, but probably see some overlapping. And uh, that R3 stage, if you're out there looking, Ellie, um, 
we're looking for, this is a complicated staging, but a three sixteenths of an inch pod on, is it one of the three or four uppermost nodes? I can't one of the, on a blank here. One of the four uppermost nodes. One of the four most upper nodes. Yeah, I couldn't remember if it was three or four, but uh, that's the number we're looking for. Uh, we should tweet a picture of that or a chart. That's always kind of hard to remember, but that's really what it's all about with soybeans is just trying to hit that window. And I would say too, you know, when we're, when we're talking about soybean fungicide applications, certainly don't be afraid to test it on your farm. I think sometimes that's the best way to see what the return on the great return from that fungicide application can be in your particular soybean field. So, you know, certainly as you have any other questions on that, don't hesitate um, to let us know. Um, Josh, I think as we wrap up here today, we've got some really exciting stuff coming in the month of July with our Enlist E3 training site. You know, before we maybe talk about just a reminder of what's to come there, I think this is a good time of the year just to get out, make sure you're assessing your your herbicide applications in corn and beans, you know, how well did those work? What are some some of those things we might want to tweak in the years to come? Um, but any insights or preview you can give us of our Enlist E3 training site coming in? Yeah, it, I, it, um, <clears throat> looking forward to number one. Um, and when you really think about the last three, four weeks with soybean weed control, it, it's been it's been challenging. You think about, you know, the dry, hot conditions. You think about some of the dicamba regulations that we deal with county by county here. You look at, it was super hot. We're on use burners where there's surfactants, right? When it's really hot and dry, the weeds be hard to kill. And you think of just, there's been so many challenges and, and there's some fields now that, you know, we didn't get the kill we're looking for. And we're so limited on options of what we can do because we're past the dicamba date. We can really hurt flowers and, and uh, you kind of reduce yield by spraying burners. And, and that really sets the stage of, you know, just the the value of the enlist weed control system. And I think as we get, um, you know, to July, we'll be sending a lot of invites to our site down there at Harmony, which is a really awesome demonstration of, of just how great the enlist system is. Um, you be able to get to see a lot of different combinations, of, you know, looking at some, you know, rates of water, <clears throat> herbicide control, weed height, but just a lot of great things going on there. And, and uh, I, I hope we can get um, a lot of customers come out and take a look at the system uh, in action. Awesome. Well, we're excited for that. Thanks for listening, everyone. That's a wrap for this week's show. We'll be back in the weeks to come with more content from the field. You've been listening to Today in Agronomy on KFILAM 1060. If you've missed part of the show or want to hear more, check out the show page at KFILradio.com or with the 103.1 KFIL app. Stay connected with Allie and Josh on Twitter. It's at Allie G-Wise, W-I-S-E, and at Josh Schaffner. Submit your questions for the show. Tune in next Wednesday for the next Today in Agronomy on KFIL AM 1060 